So I'm, I'm starting the recording again. I'll do my intro. Would you like to do the intro, Matt? Uh, so the, well, how, how so would that go? Our <laughs> intro for every episode, we, we say, welcome, dirty peasants, to okay. the Gazette, the Amphibia podcast. Okay, I can do that. Um, uh, all right, so Thumb has asked me to do the intro. So here I am doing the intro. Welcome, dirty peasants, to the Wartwood Gazette. This is Matt Brawley. Thank you, Matt. This is episode 65. I'm your host, the Vatican, and joining me today is my co-host, Nick. What's up, everybody? And Amphibia executive producer and creator, Matt Brawley. Hey, guys. So, Matt, thank you so much for coming on today. Um, this is kind of like our way of like celebrating the past 65 recordings we've done we we talk about every episode give each of them like a chance to shine and um like a minimum of an hour of discussion oh wow great (laughs) some recordings are longer than others but like we we try to give every episode like the (laughs) chance like a chance in the spotlight do you Um, mean every half hour or do you mean every 11 (laughs) oh every every half hour that's uh... okay (laughs) (laughs) yeah like you know some episodes like some 11 minute episodes go on for like an hour and a half, and then you have episodes like The Corn, The King, which go on for, yeah. for uh, Nick, how long was that recording? That was like over three hours, man. Like, oh, we my, really God. Deep in there. <laughs> oh yeah, my God. Oh my God. Deep in the weeds. Like, yeah. yeah there's, a lot, awesome. there's a lot to discuss about this show. But, That's uh, awesome. And, oh, by the way, is this a, a video interview? This is a video interview. Is, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. Hi. Good. Just, just making sure. Yeah. So, I guess to start off, we want to talk about, like, I guess the very beginning, before an episode starts, we get the the wooden title card that's actually right behind you. And right uh, here. I believe yeah. Kyler Kyler Spears designed the lo- designed the title card, and we know uh, different shows have like different ways of like showing a title. Sometimes it shows along the bottom while the episode's ongoing. Um, you have shows like Big Sea Greens where it's kind of like integrated into the episode. So uh, how would you come down to the decision of like? maybe like the first few seconds of your episodes have like this beautiful title. Like, I think it looks like Oak. It's like an Oak title card. Yeah. It's real wood. It's like, it's real and it's carved. Um, you know, it's so funny that you're asking because I have to kind of transport myself now about four or five years. Cause even though the show premiered three years ago, we started working on it like a couple of years before that. So I'm trying to put myself in the headspace of like, I really wanted something tactile, something real. Uh, shows like Flapjack, they had like real stuff, you know what I mean, in their intros that, you know, it, it helped make the show feel like it really existed outside of the, the TV. Um, so partly, selfishly, it was like a long con to get this out of it, sort of, so that I could actually have something that I could take and hold and, and be like, yeah, that was from, from our show. Um, but for tone, I wanted to really have it feel like an old storybook carving. You know what I mean? I was really on a uh, over the garden wall kick at the time, I think. And I, I really loved how it, it gave the story a certain like je ne sais quoi just out of the bat. You know, you look at a wooden carving and you're like, oh, this is something that like is rich and there's, you know, kind of like a fairy tale aesthetic here. Thank you, Matt. Yeah, and also the same way you kind of structured the seasons where it's like end of part one, end of part two. Exactly. It kind of felt like a chapter book. Exactly right, yeah, and to get that uh, that nice font and, yeah, filigrees everywhere, yeah. What, is that a custom font for the for the show? Do you mean the end of part one, end of part two stuff? Uh, I guess, I know there's like the, the end of part one, two fonts, and then as well as like any other text you have for, I guess, like promotional material. Um, yeah, that's a that's a custom font that we created just for the show because you know there's actually a lot of legal uh, stuff around using fonts and it's always good to have your own that you can now we know it's ours we know we own this you know what I mean so uh, that that font is everywhere it's on like in show text it's on like props you know what I mean like so yeah it's all over the place um, for the but the end of part one part two uh, the final the end thing that's just by hand right. you know what I mean those are those are essentially drawings. All right, thank you, Matt. So I guess we're going to start going into, we're going to talk about each of the planners, basically, and starting off with Polly. So the, the youngest family, the youngest member of the, the planner family, um, she kind of gets, she got probably the least amount of episodes focused on her. But 
she, she's by the end of the series, she's the character that kind of like physically, like by appearance, changed the most. And uh, even for the first two seasons, she doesn't even move the same way as the other characters, like different type of mobility. And the show points out how dangerous the world is and how young she is. And uh, when you already have like a young character like Sprig, and then you're adding this like even younger character into the sh into the main cast. Um, like, why did you want to have like a character like a preschooler such as Polly part of this main cast? That's a great question. Um, you're right. Where we wanted a tadpole character who changed every season because that felt really snug with you know the themes of the show and took advantage of the fact that these were frogs. I think. Polly is a lot more chaotic than Sprig. I would say more of an anarchist than Sprig. I think Sprig is very hyperactive and has a lot of energy, but I think Polly is far more violent and destructive. So I think what we brought with her to the table was this kind of like, oh, this character could do anything and could cause a lot of damage, even though she's, she's so small. I think, too, to kind of fill out the planter family, he wanted to give the impression that Hop Hop had his hands full. So he's got Sprig over here, and he's got Polly over here. And between the two of them, you can, like, barely hold it together. You know what I mean? And so then it was nice for Anne to come into the equation because then she could really feel like an older sister who could not control the two under her because she does influence them badly sometimes, but it really solidified her place in that, you know, found family as well. Um, because now even Anne has to sort of help Hop Hop look after two kids instead of just one. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a great question. Like why a younger kid? And I think the answer is, is because it helped define Anne's role and it helped define Polly's role better. Okay, thank you, Matt. And I know, Nick, your, your next question kind of like talks about these like dynamics Polly has with oh characters. yeah 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 no i mean i really just loved hearing about all that because like that's the kind of stuff that we like you know we, we talked about back in the podcast just how we love the family dynamics you know how like just when they get split up like i absolutely love that you know when Anne's just stuck with hop hop helping with the more like you, you know like the more complicated chores that really only them can um really focus on like writing bessie but then you know we move over to spring and paul i just like I, I just love those two as well like just the fact that like okay I, I'm, I'm mixing up my words there, but i'm sorry no but you're right you're right that like yeah the characters were designed so that they could pair off and be interesting no matter what the combination was and it's it's sort of like you know it's a sitcom staple like seinfeld where basically every character has such a big personality and is so well defined that like they do well when you shuffle them and you try different combinations. And I think we were after something similar with the core four members of the family. So Anne, Hop Hop, Sprig, Polly, these four needed to be entertaining on their own. They needed to be clear and entertaining when they were paired with one another. And every combination needed to be fun. Okay. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Actually, you know, that segues into something I wanted to ask you about. So, yeah, Spran, I mean, they're the heart of the show. Like, I love those two. But I also, like, I also love those few episodes that focus on Polly and Anne. I just, you know, wanted to ask you, you know, while we absolutely know what Sprig and Anne do for each other, like, I wanted to sort of, like, peel back your mind on, like, what you think makes Anne and Polly's dynamic unique. So there's really only two episodes where the two of them get to kind of pal around on their own. And we really enjoyed them for different reasons. Uh, Girl Time, very difficult episode um, to write because, you know, Anne was quite mean to Polly and at the end of the episode says some stuff that is a little bit hard to take back. And I think that it was a rare moment where like Anne, you know, could see how horrible she was acting because she's literally mistreating a baby. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and that's not quite the same thing as an experience she would have with Sprig. You know what I mean? Like if if she makes Sprig upset, like, you know, at the end of the day, he's a little bit older and he can probably take it. But I think when you see Polly and she's feeling really bad about herself because of something Anne said, it hits her much differently because she's like, 
even though it seems like Polly is aggressive and rambunctious, she is very young and very tender. And I think that like that really spoke to Anne seeing her like, oh, she doesn't have her confidence anymore because I said she was gross. Um, and then in the second <laughs> episode, Lost in Utopia, which is like one of my favorites, just like the oh, one same our, here, same like, here. oh my god, just one of our funniest episodes, hands down, like the tales, tales, tales stuff, and and just the escalation, you know what I mean? It's like a snowball rolling down a hill. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger for those two. But they just got to like have fun together. And I think what was so like wholesome about that was, you know, it really felt like they were encouraging one another and there was no uh, judgment. <laughs> and so we really got to see them both kind of like, I mean, that's the, that's the way that the situation has spiraled so far out of control. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that, in the same way that Anne gets to be an older sister to Sprig, she gets to be an older sister to Polly, and that's just a slightly different flavor and dynamic. I think that, like, since Sprig and Anne are so close in age, it's it's different to me than when, like, Anne is hanging out with Polly. Like, they're having fun, but at the end of the day, like, Polly's a little baby. Like, you know, in Return to War, when, when she, like, picks her up, she's like, oh, no, 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 you didn't do it. You're just a real baby. Like, I love that stuff because it's a good reminder that even though, because, you know, Polly sounds like an adult and is played by like a 30 year old woman. Uh, she's still a baby. Oh yeah, totally. I mean, I, I even just have to say, yeah, I, I love the much from Girl of Time and Lost in Utopia because it, well, Girl of Time is sort of like the setup for the sisterhood. And Lost in Utopia is just a payoff, man. Like we're just watching an episode of these two going across Utopia wreaking hell in there. Like it's just totally. it's 11, <laughs> it's 11 minutes of total mayhem. Totally. And, and, you know, Polly has a very specific relationship with Anne that is not, not the same as Spriggs, because I think that by the end of the show, you get the feeling that like, you know, oh, is Sprig going to be okay if Anne leaves? You know what I mean? Whereas like, I feel like mm. Polly loves Anne, but is such an independent creature that it's different. It hits different. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Polly's going to be okay. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel yeah. like Polly's going to be fine. And so that's that's a very, you know, it defines both of those characters because when Sprig had Anne enter his life, it was such a, cat or it was just such a huge thing. It was a catalyst for his kind of, you know, who he is. And I think Polly was obviously enjoying Anne being there and loves her, but it's not quite the same. Oh, yeah, totally. I mean, yeah, def that definitely, like, clears up some things in my mind now. Um. Yeah, I was also going to ask, I know, like, so they only got two episodes, right? Like, did you guys ever have anything planned, like, anything else planned for them? Or are you just, like, satisfied with just having those two? Um, let me think about that. Uh, I am satisfied with those two, and I'm pretty happy with, you know, their interactions. I think that any time in All In, Polly says, like, well, do you go kick his butt or something? I felt like they had such a strong, confident relationship that they're, apart from them getting into like, you know, more disagreements um, where you could learn a little bit about both of them, like, and I don't know that I wanted to do that, like to have them fight. Cause like, that's always a little bit like, oh, I don't know. I don't, I don't know that I want this to. <laughs> I like them. I like, I like them on each other's team. You know what I mean? So yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think I'm happy with that stuff. I mean, I, I would love to know how Polly thinks about Anne now like in, you know, after Anne has left, someone did a really sweet comic um, was that it, was going around. It was like Ivy Sundu, something like the Twitter handle. I remember it was like her. Shout out, shout out. It was so yeah, good. And it was so, it was so insightful because Polly's so young in the events of the show that it really makes you wonder like, oh, how solid are her memories in the future of Anne? It's very interesting, really, you know, tragic and heartbreaking to yeah. explore yeah. Really. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah i know whoops yeah. but like but very 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 good very good stuff i really i really appreciated that yeah i mean, I mean me and thumb we've talked about it like a poly spinoff all right we, we need that right like, yeah and i you know when uh um when amphibia ended we talked a lot about you know the idea of a spinoff and, and what that would look like and a lot of people were were excited about that internally, and I I'd, I'd be interested to know where that's where that is right now because like I I think we all talked about like shorts. Ooh, we'd love to do shorts, and like 
can you imagine? It would just be like robots, 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 man. <laughs> you know, like yes. <laughs> it'd be very cool. It kind of ends the series like having her own like little cast where she has like she introduced the the newer editions of the Planner family like Frobo and Micro Angelo. Mm -hmm. And by the end, she has them. She has a bunch of snorts. That's true. She's probably one of the most like experienced people in Phibia. Like, yeah. In this, like new world. Where, like, yeah, she's. You're saying she's primed for her spinoff. She was like, "I'm ready." <laughs> so whatever. Uh, pretty much, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. No. I love her though, and Amanda Layton, the actor, is is really brilliant. All right. So moving on to the, we, we started off with the youngest planner. We're gonna go to the the oldest planner now, and uh, like Hop Pop is like I think Nick and I like that's our our favorite planner of. Uh, uh yeah. I mean, I, I, he's, we, Matt, we know you can't like, you can't pick favorites, but but we can. <laughs> and, yeah, of course. Uh, yeah. Hop Pop's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, Okay. I guess so. Hop Hop is a crisp sixty-eight, and yeah, I guess um, what what made you want to have like a very old um, caretaker of these kids, and was this generational gap always was it always intended to like have like this missing piece for Mister and Missus Boon Choi to fill in like ever since the beginning of the series, or was that something that you came up with later on um that is something we came up with later and man it fits like a glove though right so you you i mean i would love to say that like that particular plot beat was like <laughs> i wasn't even sure like well i was i was pretty sure we were going to meet ann's parents um in season three when when we were writing season one but you know you write these seasons being like Oh God, I hope we get, you know what I mean? Like, like we literally wrote the cliffhanger for season one, trying to get our season two pickup. And we, we literally wrote the season two cliffhanger trying to get our season three pickup. So these things were always, you, you, you never were sure. And I, you would always like kind of have this fear of like, man, if we don't get that pickup, we are screwed. You know what I mean? Cause like these cliffhangers are intense. Um, so at that point, early season one, that wasn't something that, um, I was sure was going to happen, but I will tell you that it comes from an instinct of like parents, like parents are no fun. Okay. And when I, when I, when I say that, what I mean is the, the presence of, of uh, Polly and Spriggs parents would just be one more hurdle to kind of their adventures because they would of course have all these rules and restrictions. But what was nice about a grandpa is that because he's so old, and, you know, you can tell he's kind of harried, like he didn't sign up for this and he, he didn't know he was going to raise these kids. It, it really makes you sympathetic towards him and you really understand that this is a guy who's just trying to do his best. You know what I mean? It just changes the flavor. And then also it makes the family feel incomplete, which is great because then Anne can come in and kind of fill in the, fill in the gaps. So I think it was more that like, there was no version of the show that had Sprig and Polly's parents there that was fun to me, I guess. Oh, okay. And, like, on the topic of, like, Hop Hop kind of, like, raising this family, um, we got to see how Anne's arrival with the Calamity Box kind of uh, influenced his actions and how that fed into his fears. And I was like, I think for season one, we had Anne kind of give Hop Hop and the and the planners, or well, specific, specifically Hop Hop, more agency on how to get back home. And yeah. I, I guess when when Hop Hop buried the box, and when we saw like the book and the dangers of it, uh, did you have already like were you already aware of like I guess Leaf? Did you know about Leaf and what was what and why the book existed in the first place? Yeah, so Leaf was planned from very early on. And like one of the things that I'm super happy with is like the P thing, like the P flip. Because like the P flip is a real like, oh shit moment. Like for me, like I was so excited about that. Because like, again, that's something that doesn't get to pay off until like season three. So we have to earn yeah. it. <laughs> we have to like wait and get there and, and wait and wait and wait. Now, knowing about Leaf though means that like, yes, hop up. Hop up hiding the box was always going to be a little bit of a red herring. And I knew that, like, you know what I mean? That like, it was going to make the audience feel like, and also I knew so many audiences okay. were coming right off of Gravity Falls where like, it turned out there was this big secret and that like, he was, you know, working on this machine in the basement. 
But for Hop Hop, I, I craved something a little bit simpler and different that was a little bit more like, he didn't have a plan. In fact, he, he made a bad plan, which was to hide the box and then just lie about it. But he didn't have like this great, and I think it lends to the idea that Hop Hop is sort of like going by the seat of his pants a little bit, where he's like, okay, I'm hiding this box because there's, there's, there's no way that like, you know, I'm going to let this dangerous thing you know, get found and my family's going to be in trouble. What does that mean for me? Does that mean I raise this, this creature? I guess, I guess, I guess it does like for now, you know what I mean? And I'll figure it out as, as things progress. But like, I think, you know, and that's, what's so great about like that scene in after the rain where Anne's like, well, you're just going to keep me here. Like, what are you, some kind of sicko? You know what I mean? And, and he's very much like, well, no, I mean, yes. I mean, I would have taken care of you, but I'm not a sicko. You know what I mean? Like you have to understand that like, I'm, I'm grappling between some very different things right now. And he actually went to go dig it up because he was like, okay, wait, no, we do need this thing. And I do really care about Anne. So I'm just going to go dig it up. And it's like, I never buried it. And of course that's when he gets caught. But for me, what was so nice about that is that he was, he's still a farmer. He's not like, he doesn't have some like a crazy plan or machine or, you know what I mean? That he's working on. He's a very simple guy and he's always, He's always true to that. Sure, it turns out that he's related to Leaf, but that connection is more just kind of like a nice payoff than any kind of like, well, that means I'm some kind of, like, no, no, no. It's just, she was a farmer too. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay, shoot. Yeah, that is just hands down my favorite part about the whole box plot. Just, there's no huge lore revelation. There's there's no, like, Hop Up, he doesn't know anything, man. He's just a spoiled yeah. man who wants yeah. to make sure his family is always safe. He, he just, yes. He's just trying to make it to tomorrow every day. Like, I just, like, that's easily just my favorite part about that. Yeah, the guy can barely, I feel like this this poor man is 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 barely holding it together, which is probably why you guys like him so much. It's so relatable, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and I know, like, Hop Up was always, like, the caretaker for the for the kids, and then even Nick, I know you had a couple of notes about like Hop Hop's goal was to get everyone to Utopia, but then what happens after that, right? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Because at that point, I mean, he's like you know, yeah, in stories like these, he's like you know the mentor figure, right? Like yes. he has his own role yes. in the family, right? And like it sort of felt like after they got to like the Utopia was like his highest purpose as a mentor, right? Like he got them there, right? They got like they found everything new they knew about the box, they caught, got the whole Temple Quest, but after that, like. It's sort of like a hot pot. Like, is there anything else you can do? So, like, it yeah. opens up this question of, like, what's next for Hop Pop, right? And, like, I think, I mean, for me, like, I, I just loved all the, thing, all the things you guys did for him in Season 3. It just felt like after all the struggling and growth he did in Season 2, there's there, it was just sort of victory lap for him, right? Like, yeah. Avengers and Cat sitting, like, it's, oh, oh sorry. I'll, yeah. I'll yeah, he's, no, exactly. Like, I think that, you know, and then when Anne has to take care of him, it's this really satisfying role reversal because it's like, not that he gets to like chill for a beat, but he's like, I'm not the, I'm not the authority figure. You know what I mean? Like, and like, that's yeah. freeing. <laughs> that's gotta be freeing for him. Yeah. And like, also consider that like, this is something that we were all talking about in the writer's room, which is like, Hop Hop shouldn't have buried the box and lied, obviously. But because he buried the box, they didn't have it with them in Utopia where King Andreas surely would have taken it. Do you know what I mean? So like there's these this ripple effect of like Hop Hop's really bad decision that ended up kind of helping them for a bit. Because then I can see like the king would have taken the box and like even when they're charging the stones, he still would have had this key piece, you know what I mean? That that this leverage yeah. on all the of the rest of the characters. So and even though it all goes belly up anyway, in true colors, like totally goes belly up. I do think that like Hop Hop's instincts were not horrible like this thing is dangerous he's right to be afraid of it he just has the wrong reaction you know yeah and i guess like the yeah like they, like i was really interested about like how you talked about how him bearing the box like how that influenced whether or not andrews had control over it early on yeah it's just a really nice thought uh yeah, no. <laughs> like, it's yeah, really it's like, great to hear all this stuff like he totally fucked up it's just that it's just a question of like in that moment, Andrews is like, well, can I see it? You have the box? Let's see it. And they're like, ah, oh, we don't actually have it. And you know, in his head, Andrews was like, fuck. You know what I mean? Just for, <laughs> why don't they have it? You know what I mean? Like, so I, I like that stuff. I like it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And I guess like the final question for Hop Up. So 
we didn't really get to see Hop Hop in his youth. We got to see the shot in which uh, yeah. isn't really canon. It's just we, we saw his like flowing hair. Um, I think Ant Theft Auto. We saw a flashback kind of covered his face, and then we saw the Bizarre Bizarre where he's the record. I just want to know was was the record what Hop Hop always looked like, or was that just a costume? Like, has that always been a costume? <laughs> yeah, was that it always that buff? That is a great question. So firstly, I do think the Halloween special is canon. It was just aired out of order. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think, I think it is canon. I think I'm, I'm ready to commit to that because there's nothing in there that really contradicts like anything in the show. Like, and even the blue moon, this curse thing, I was like, well, that could have been a core experiment. You know what I mean? So like, part of me is, is, is okay with the idea that like, this is canon, so like you can imagine a young hop hop looking looking the way he does. I do think for the record specifically, I think that it always would have required some kind of prosthesis because that guy is just so different, so different from what hop hop looks like. Even in his youth, I don't think he was ever quite that swole. So I think that you know the idea that he wears stilts and has this like prosthetic like face, I think that that was always how he was at you know at the bizarre bizarre. It's it is something that that begs like like some kind of comic or some kind of you know what I mean like short story of just like what was what was young Hop Hop doing? It kind of lends itself well into his like his acting career. Where he has oh, hundred yeah, percent, yeah. yeah. <laughs> now you're cooking with gas. Well, there goes our chances of shredded Hop Hop, but we'll, we'll, we'll move on. <laughs> yeah, we can move on to the the I guess the last frog planter of the family, uh, Sprig. So, it, it's easy for me to identify the change Sprig and, not Sprig, Polly and Hop Hop go through. Mm -hmm. So, it's a physical change for Polly. Um, Hop Hop, it's more about, like, his outlook on life. Um, Sprig is it for, like, personally for me, I can't really come up with, like, a single sentence to describe, to describe Sprig. And, like, looking at Sprig throughout the series, he doesn't have as many conflicting thoughts going through his mm -hmm. head like Marcy, Sasha, Anne, Andreas, or even Hop Hop. And he's very direct with what he wants and what he intends to do. So a lot of the episodes surrounding him, like, there's challenges that are kind of childish, which is normal because he's young. But we also get surprisingly mature challenges <laughs> involving stuff like marriage, education, mm -hmm. his commitments <laughs> yeah. to his family. And, like, so dating yeah. season, Spring gets schooled, yeah. Groundhog Day, yeah. Fool Me This. Yeah. And yeah. So, is it possible to describe all of these like character moments and relationships that he has with his family? Is there a way to kind of like, kind of like describe it under like one theme or one arc for Sprig? Is that is that? Even oh, possible? it's arc. Yeah, yeah. Um, I I feel like the best way to think about Sprig, and I think you've kind of hit on it, is that the reason why we actually cast like a younger actor for Sprig is because we always wanted him to feel like a real kid. And I think that like that's the difference with Polly, who has this amazing adult performer doing the voice, and even Brenda Song, who, you know, is 30, mid-30s, doing the voice of a 13-year-old. Sprig is different because he's like truly a real kid. And I think that what's so nice about that is actually uh, the actor, he ages across the three seasons and gets not too much mind you i was always waiting for like hey, it's me spring you know what i mean but <laughs> it, it never happened so like i kept waiting like oh when are we gonna like are we gonna get gumballed here or you know what i mean or like and he, he always was able to maintain a, a pretty high register voice but if you watch the first episode you watch the hardest thing it's a different sounding yeah game. you know what i mean like no question but what's nice about that is like he's getting older He's still a normal kid, but he's getting more and more and more attached to Anne throughout the show. So Sprig's arc to me, you know, his character is he's a real kid. He's a real kid. And his arc to me is, you know, almost this kind of like the show is about change and about how like, you know, whether you want to or not, people are going to leave your life. They're going to leave they're gonna come back there's gonna be these big ebbs and flows and i think sprig has the hardest kind of arc of all which is that over the course of three seasons we've seen him just like adoring Anne and like getting closer with her and just appreciating her and so of course 
his story is about having to let her go. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So like, it's it's a very kind yeah. of like slow thing because that's not something that happens like, ah, here are the tent poles, episode one, midpoint, end point. It's more just this kind of like, oh shit, at the end where it's like, for this message, for this story to really feel true, Sprig also has to participate. You know what I mean? So it's this kind of like heartbreaking thing, but that is necessary for him so that he can live his life undefined by her. Do you know what I mean? Like he can now be his own person because like part of the show too is about how, you know, you can't live your life defined by others. And we, we love our friends, but like, you know, almost the best thing that ever happened to Anne was to be isolated from Marcy and Sasha and to kind of for once in her life, get to be herself. You know what I mean? Like independent of them. Um, and I think that, it's important for Sprig to experience the same the same thing now moving forward. So I think, yeah, that's sort of my take on that, which is that you are right, is that like he doesn't have the kind of A to B to C that like some of the other characters do, a, a, like a very clear arc, but he does have a hard job. You know what I mean? He does he does have kind of this <clears throat> noble purpose at the end of the story, which is to kind of like say goodbye to Anne. So that's sort of my thoughts on that. Oh, okay, thank you, Matt. Like. Yeah, we kind of talked about how, like, it feels like everything in this show is, like, after Sprig. Like, whether it's, like, an actual, like, antagonist or, like, monster. Even, like, the themes mm -hmm. of the show where it's, like, everything involving Leaf, like, goes through Sprig. Every, like, every season finale, Sprig is, like, anything yes. involving Sprig is, like, kind of, like, the turning point of the episode. Yes. Well, he's her yeah. rudder. You know what I mean? He's her, he's her constant. Because, like, while well, everyone else is, like, <laughs> I mean, not really Polly, but, like, everyone else is like backstabbing in and like breaking her trust. <laughs> but like Sprig is the one person I think that she can, she can really count on to just be himself and be there for her. He has no ulterior motive. You know what I mean? And I think that's why when he's the one who gets dropped out the window, it's like, <gasps> you know, like, yeah. Like, <gasps> yeah. <laughs> like that's just yeah. an awesome thing about Sprig. Like there's no, there's no baggage to befriending Sprig, right? Like he's, I think he just, really helps the more complex characters like um hop hopper and right because they have their own arcs and they're gonna project i mean there's so many episodes where, where they just project their problems right on the spring and he's yeah to, like especially he's hop -hop. the one to help them develop yeah <laughs> like it's just i don't know it's just great to see and i just love spring's role in the series and god I'm like no what you just said like that's a lot to think about like i never realized like i knew these were part like i knew the idea that we have um episodes where the characters they don't want to live life how, like with, yeah they don't want to live a life that people are forcing out to them like i never saw it as like as a, like a connective theme but yeah that's definitely gonna make me like look at look at the series in a completely different way well and also like you know you could say that sprig's arc will have to take place like sort of in your head after the show because now unmoored from Anne, what's he gonna do you know what I mean? Like, spin off? Like, how is he gonna? Well, I just mean like, I mean, it's it's sort of for your your imagination, but but the idea of like, now he must be his own person. You know what I mean? And he's got her memories with him, and he's got that statue that he can always look at and feel a sense of guidance. But now Sprig must sally forth and be his own frog. You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, especially the statue that's like pointing forward for him. I know. I know. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. <sighs> Like that's that scene always breaks my heart. Like when I just like I tell myself, don't watch the hardest thing. Do not. You're gonna feel terrible. Like, yeah. Don't watch the hardest thing. I'm like I just get to that scene of the statue. Like that's too much. You guys are yeah. cool for that. <laughs> I like too that they replace the town founder who is like who even knows who that guy is. Get it out of here. You know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and like now that we started like talking about Anne with Sprague, like we can kind of get into like the the you already started in the beginning talking about Anne's inclusion into the family um like we can talk a little bit about Anne because before so Anne's life before amphibia it wasn't it wasn't terrible no because you know she was she was financially stable she had she had a complicated friendship but it was still salvageable um she had the standard like parent child misunderstandings but they're, they're still loving parents and she wasn't even like she wasn't excelling in school, but she still had educators like looking out for her. And then you you reach the end of like you you, re you reach all in, and you know Anne's like looking at like the Who Am I paper, and she's looking back at the planners, and she's talking about how like meeting you three like the quote is meeting you three has changed all of that, and 
Anne could have ended up anywhere with anyone in Amphibia, and she ends up with this frog family. And <coughs> com- compared to characters like Anderson Grime, they they were they did have they were affected by like the kids they were with in a positive way, but they weren't exactly the best role models to Sasha and Marcy. But the planners aren't flawless people either. But what makes their what makes the relationship with Anne uh, unique and mutually beneficial for both for both parties? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, you bring up a really good point where it's like, well, Anne's life wasn't terrible. And I agree that it was not terrible. Um, but I do think that Anne wasn't really like living in a way that was like the best version of herself. And I think that when you see, you know, that opening scene in All In where she's like, I don't think we should do this. And they're like, who cares? And she's like, you okay. You know what I mean? Like, and you know, the principal, <laughs> the principal is basically like, like, I see you, like, I see you and I know you are not making these decisions. I know you are not following your own moral compass. So like, when is that going to start happening? And I think that why the planters sort of unlock that for her is because they need her, you know what I mean? And that they need each other in this moment to like do that for one another. I think that the show is ultimately, and this kind of feeds into like one of your later questions that I'm saving, I'm saving that. Uh, But like the show is a love letter to people like Anne who don't have a lot of self-esteem. And when you don't have a lot of self-esteem, you tend to let other people make decisions for you. You tend to question your own decisions and you tend to like really question your own compass. You know what I mean? Your own gut. And I think that like, you know, what's nice about the planters is, is they're so humble. They're like bottom of the, like bottom of the barrel in this pecking order. And that's, that's ultimately why we came up with this kind of like, you know, species based kind of role kind of pecking order thing is you wanted Anne to feel like she's once again at the bottom of it. You know what I mean? But she's now surrounded by the planters who are also there with her, this humble little frog family that is very incomplete. And Anne finally has something of great value to bring. Um, And I think that previously it wasn't, it wasn't like that with, with Marcy and Sasha, where she was kind of going along with their ideas and she was like, kind of like, you know what I mean? Letting them walk all over her. And now she's with these people who like, value her opinion and that she can make a difference in their lives and i think that's why like it's so different for her it hits so different for her when she thanks them you know what i mean in in all in because for for her they really unlocked something for her whereas like for grime you know he basically is sasha it was like two sashas that just get to kind of like you know realize like look at each other in a mirror and be like oh i see you and like oh we need to be a little different don't we you know what i mean like that's that's very different than Anne, who is arriving in this place and being like i'm needed and i'm wanted and like this is making me feel very different (laughs) than i felt before and again Anne didn't have bad parents but you just don't listen to your parents you know what i mean and i'm sure her parents were like we wish x y and z would happen for you like we wish you would study more we wish you had a little bit more purpose in your life or we wish that you stood up to your friends sometimes and like you know but you know how it is like sometimes you need to go out there and experience it for yourself and then when you come back, you're like, you were right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, should have listened. But yeah, I think that's why it's it's a little bit different for Anne. And I do think that's why the planters were so important for her. Okay, wow, yeah. Yeah, I mean, honestly, yeah. Yeah, like that, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that was a great answer. Yeah, thank you. I mean, Jesus, I mean, like, I even have to say, like, yeah, like, um, I mean, and yeah, and coming to Warwood and living the planters, that was sink or, like, that was sink or swim, right? Like, she did yeah, like, yeah, when you just, think about all this stuff like there's just so many reasons for why the planners were just so good for Anne and like yeah I mean like one of them which I just find kind of funny to think about is just like cousin Stan like she had to be uh, she had to be good she had to be on her best behavior otherwise they would have like thrown her yeah her cousin Stanley. <laughs> like, it's, like I just love that <laughs> like, it's crazy you know Kane came crazy in season one it's crazy where Hop Hop's like, so help me God, I'm going to throw you out. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> and, you know, we struggled with that episode for a long time because, like, it just sounded so mean. Is he really going to throw her out? You know what I mean? Like, to, to the elements. And then, like, ultimately it was like, yeah. Yeah, he is. Because, like, otherwise there's no, like, there's this incentive for Anne to be like, oh, shit, I got to. I got like you know what I mean like I got to make this work. <laughs> I don't want to be, I don't want to go back to the cave. <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, really? Just, wait, wait, yes, that's... Domino. Oh, no, she just ran away. Holy right. shit. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Holy shit. Not to tease. Yeah. I was like, come on, meet them. And then she's she's out of here. So we'll get her back. We'll get her back. Anyway, uh, proceed. Proceed. Yeah, so we, uh, you already kind of got into, like, the the family dynamic of the show. Like, because each of the players are kind of like a different demographic where even though the kids aren't too many years apart from each other, it's still like a... Even as a kid, like seeing someone like me two or three years older is like, it's like a different generation. Basically. Yeah, it's a lot. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and like, especially when Anne, Anne's 13, but you know, sometimes she's written to be kind of like 16. Like 16. Yeah, and then, she's 13. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then Sprig's 11. Polly, Polly's, I think, six or five or. Yeah, Polly's five or six. Yeah. yeah. Right. And then you have like Hop Hop, who's just Chris, Chris, Chris 68. 68. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. Do you ever. Like, what are the challenges and advantages of, like, writing this kind of, like, diverse ensemble cast? Did, like, do you guys have this, like, do you guys ever, do the writers ever have the situation where you're thinking, like, oh, is this, like, character too young or is this character <sighs> too old to be, like, part of, like, this episode, this plot? Yeah, I mean, there's, like, there's some, there were some moments where I was, like, oh, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I think, I think Anne says, like, I was on varsity and I was, like, uh, uh like i mean like high, like middle school varsity like so there, there were a couple of lines where i was like ah no that's not quite not quite right and it like you know made it into the final but um i think that like ultimately our writing team was like like our story editor was you know mid 40s early 50s uh some of us were like um late 30s some of us were like uh late 20s you know what i mean so like we we did have like i mean we didn't have we didn't have any like like um, kids <laughs> you know? but, but i do think that like we did have a pretty broad like range of experiences and i think that like you know the older folks drifted towards writing hop up the younger ones drifted towards writing like marcy and sprig you know what i mean i was sort of in the middle with Anne, but we had a nice kind of like you know rapport and and at least some diversity of experience in the writer's room and also the you know I feel like the board artists that were all around, they're all around 30 or mid 20s. Like that was a little bit more like, you know. Well, I think uh, Alicia Rocha had like a perfect like sketch. Like Nick, I can, I can't, I can't check Nano Paul goes like archive, but like she had the sketch of like all the kids like Naruto running and then like Hop Hop's just like sitting there. Yes. Like, like, <laughs> yes. Yes. Exa exactly. And I think that like, you know, that was fun and it was, also, there's this notion that, like, Anne is, like, an alien from another dimension. And so, like, even though hop Up, Polly, and Sprig are all different ages, none of them knows what binge-watching is. You know what I mean? So it's, like, it's there were these nice unifying points for them as well, even though they're, the ages are all over the place. Oh, okay. Thank you, Matt. And I guess we can start getting into, like, the last couple of questions. Um, So this question is kind of about season one. So... As the series aired over the years, it gave more reasons for people to check out the show and fall in love with it. And maybe someone was interested in what happens in season two or three, but to get to that point, that, that moment they're looking for, they, they, they need to watch season one. Mm. And for, for reference, like Nick and I, we discovered the show during season one, so our expectations and first impressions on how the show is presented, it's like vastly different oh, from yeah. someone else. No, I understand. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, for a variety of reasons, you know, someone might approach the first season thinking it's the F word because a lot of it takes place in one in one small town compared to the rest of the series. So yeah. I, was, I don't wanna how do I how do I pitch season one to someone without making concessions to the criticisms some people have with it? Because I, I see these like well meaning um, statements where it's like they describe season one as like a slow burn or wait wait for episode 10 but it, it kind of has that like negative connotation mm, so it's like yeah. how do i how do i avoid that when i try to describe like basically these first few episodes of the show are the planners like becoming a family and like forming the the foundation of the show yeah 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 so very tricky question to ask me i think that like something that you need to understand about the show because you can totally do this. And I, I saw these comments popping up um, around like, you know, the end of season two. And it's usually like, here's a guide. Like, here's the quick guide for watching the show if you don't actually want to watch it. You know what I mean? Like, and I was like, oh, well, I understand that like, 
you know, we've all got a limited amount of time. And if you just want the core story beats, here you go. Here, here they are, you know, episode one, episode 10. You know what I mean? You probably need to watch Bizarre Bizarre. You know, that, that kind of thing. Like, totally, totally. And I, again, I, I would never blame anyone for wanting to experience the show that way. What I will say, though, is that because Amphibia is more than its story, like, it's more than just, like, we got to get the MacGuffin to stop the villain before he does X, Y, and Z. Like, because it's it's a little bit more about just getting to know characters and getting to care about characters and spend time with them. Season one is a gift in that regard because it helps you care about these characters before the, like, grand adventure and the high stakes kick in. And it's kind of amazing how much more you care about them if you've seen season one. And this is something that I've been able to observe across the board, where it's like, there were season three episodes where like season one characters came back and you could just tell who didn't see season one. You could just immediately tell yeah. who, and you know what, again, no judgment because like we're all watching these shows for, for different things. But the wonderful thing about a character like Tritonio coming back is because he had such a strong opinion and perspective on Anne when they first ran into each other in season one. And you see that perspective change based on them meeting again in season three. And to me, that's a very rewarding setup and payoff, even though it's not like a plot twist or a giant like high stakes episode. It's just as important to the show as those high stakes episodes. So while I understand that like some people don't have the time, I would really pitch season one as like, you know, this is your opportunity to actually fall in love with these characters. And if you skip it, which you can do, you run the risk of not doing so. You know what I mean? Like, you run the risk then of sort of having missed the forest for the trees. You sort of run the risk of not feeling things as deeply when you get to true colors and not feeling things as deeply when you get to all in. And then you, you'll you just have, like, a much different experience, like, honestly. Like, it seems like it seems like some of these stories are just, like, you know, throwaway monster of the week stuff but it's really your opportunity to spend time with these characters divorced from a high stakes yarn and it really it hits different it hits different like and again you you have to ask someone who has seen like the entire show um but like yeah it's 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 valuable valuable character stuff that like you know especially for a show that is about Anne's journey like it really truly is about Anne's journey if you skip kind of her biggest growth, you will really be experiencing a much shallower version of the same story. So again, it's it's their choice. It's anyone's choice. Like we all have so much time and you know, if, if there's a lot of people too, not a lot of people, but there's people who I've seen who just, they don't really like comedy. Like they don't really, it doesn't, it doesn't grab them and they, they just want the, the nuts and bolts of the, of the story. Um, and that's, that's, that's you, like you do you and like no judgment, like we all consume media differently and like, that's totally fair. But like, to me, I will always insist that like, if you really want to feel connected to these characters, I would not skip season one. All right. Thank yeah, you. Like, I, I, yeah. I know you talked about like, why, like we, we talked about why do people watch the show and mm -hmm. you have characters like the band of planners. You also have characters like. Sasha and Marcy, who yeah, their appearances were intentionally minimal compared to Anne. That's right. But w within seconds of their introductions, became like fan favorites. Yeah, for, like for a lot here's, of here, so it's like, here's Domino. Hey, oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> like this is the best, the best cat, <clears throat> the best inspiration, the best. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> my lord and savior. Yeah, yeah. Go on, oh, yes, like, right, yes, like, Sasha and Marcy. Sorry, Domino distracted me. Um, yeah, of course. <laughs> so, right on cue. God right now. <laughs> so, like, people find those characters interesting, and there's a lot of speculation and learning about the a part of their lives that we don't really see, like Marcy's time in Utopia, which will, will probably be addressed in the book, as well as Sasha's time in Toe Tower and with the Resistance. So, and then also, like, fancy a lot of themselves and their own past friendships within this trio and mm. be because of this the girls and their dynamic is like from what i can tell 
the most discussed mm. and prominent element of the show by the community, whether mm. it's like comment sections or mm. video analysis or even even like interviews such as this, mm. where there's like a lot of discussion trying to figure out what they mm. what they are. Yeah. And if you like, I'm not sure if you anticipated this level of like excitement and engagement with this specific aspect of the show, but if you did, what made you want to focus or structure the show around Anne and the planners' time together instead of maybe like Anne, Sasha, and Marcy's time in Amphibia? So there is like an enormous kind of like meta irony to this question and this kind of like discussion because ultimately the show is about Anne, a character with low self-esteem who doesn't think she's as good as Marcy or Sasha. Marcy's so smart, Sasha's so charismatic, Anne's like, what do I bring to the table? You know what I mean? So the idea that like, this show is a love letter to that person. The show is, is not really a love letter to each of these characters given like equal weight. It really is about Anne. And it's a celebration of how someone who doesn't think they have anything to bring to the table can bring the most important thing, which in Anne's case is empathy. Um, so I think that like my choice to focus on Anne has always come from that love of those kinds of people. And you know, that's not me. Like the I had a friend group and I was not the Anne, but like I and it's taken me many years to kind of appreciate, I think, the Anne in my group. Do you know what I mean? So like I think that it would be very popular, I'm sure, and people would really love it to kind of just, if <laughs> a third of the show is Marcy and the third of the show is Sasha, and it was like split evenly between the three girls, but that's actually not the story I set out to tell. Um, and I think too, that from my point of view, I'm always, I've always been a less is more kind of guy. Like that's just what I like. I love leaving things open to interpretation. And I think part of the intense, like the desire to know more about Sasha and Marcy is because you don't know. You know what I mean? Like, if you were to hammer these details down, you would know, but it ultimately wouldn't deliver satisfaction necessarily. It would just be information for your checklist. You know what I mean? So like, for me, the most important thing for this story is to do justice to Anne's journey and her arc and make sure to give it the love and the focus that I thought it needed. So like, yeah, I really think that, you know, my goal was to give Anne this character who once again, in this kind of glorious meta commentary on, on the show itself, doesn't think much of herself and to give her the spotlight. All right, yeah, thank you, Matt. Yeah. I guess, Nick, you can take the final question. Oh yeah, I mean, I was just gonna say like, yeah, that just makes total sense right there, Matt, like what you said, like I, like I, see, so yeah, I mean, Amphibia is about a lot of things and I feel like the planters including Anne, like, I feel like they just resemble that part of the show more than compared to Sasha and Marcy, which just, which is going to naturally make it so the show just needs to focus more on them, right? Like, just the ideas of change, um, the ebb and flow of friendships, like, yeah, everything that just comes with that, right? And, like, when you have, like, two characters who don't really start improving as people until the final season, like, you kind of got to prioritize the people who are actually are changing, right? And, like, I, like, to me, I've always just looked at the show like that, and that's just what's made everything that makes sense to me. Yeah, I think it's not it's not the same as like Guardians of the Galaxy or something where it's like you have a team and like each character is is sort of given the floor. It really is like, oh, this is also a story about how when you achieve independence from, you know, basically these crutches, like these these people in your life, you know, this friend group, this really rigid friend group, when you go outside the group and you start to find yourself independently of that group, like you can achieve kind of amazing growth and realize things about yourself you never knew. And I think that had the show decided to kind of like equally divide itself between the three humans, it would just feel, it would feel like a very different show. Not bad, not, not better, not worse, just, yeah. just different. Yeah. Right. So I guess our final question is kind of about the, the ending of the show. Um, Nick, you want to take this one? Yeah, like, this is... I mean, th there's, like, a lot of things I want to ask here. Yeah, like, I'm ready. I mean, this is it, yeah. yeah. This is a doozy right here. Yeah, like, I mean, 
you want founded our found family. Like you, you built a whole show mm. around these four characters coming mm. together and forming like one of the strongest bonds we've ever mm. seen in all media. And then like you <laughs> end it all on tearing them apart and having the audience cope with the fact they might never see each other again. Like, like I just like I just have to know like. I know you pre-planned Amphibia, right? Like, you knew what ending you wanted for the show, right? But, like, I just have to know, like, when you were going through it, like, were there any moments where you were writing, like, this really sweet and sappy scene with them? Were you thinking about, like, what you did to them in the end? Like, like did you have any doubts while going well, through all that? I mean, so it's a, it's a very complicated answer. Um, I will say that when we were writing season 3A which like has a lot of the planters and Anne getting to just spend like fun time together. I did it because I was like, this is, this is it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they need to enjoy the company that they have now because like, you know, at the end of this story, they, they won't get to have the same thing. So, um, you know, and for me, Amphibia has never been a show about wish fulfillment. It is just, is just not that show. And the ending is the same. The ending is, is not wish fulfillment. I will be honest, a couple of times I almost chickened out. A couple of times I almost wrote the ending where like, you know, we can see each other whenever and like we beat the bad guys and we can like hang out and like, I'll see you on the weekends. You know what I mean? But like, it was hollow. I couldn't, I couldn't really define it for you. And though it sounds like very sweet, and wonderful on paper, it ultimately made the show feel like it was about nothing. You know what I mean? Like, because all this like stuff that Anne had experienced, you know, and these this philosophy that she's kind of taken to heart, especially when it comes to Leaf, who is pleading with the characters to kind of like understand the idea that just because we're not together doesn't mean we're not, like doesn't mean we're truly apart. You know what I mean? We carry pieces of each other wherever we go because of these memories we share the idea that Anne wouldn't have to follow through on that felt very strange, very strange to me, very kind of like, well, then what was the point of this show? You know what I mean? Like, and, and as, yeah. as kind of like, yeah, as kind of direct as that may feel, you know, it is ultimately the reason why I stuck true to the ending that I always wanted, which is that, you know, and you, by the way, you narrowed in correctly on the word might they might not see each other again. And I think that's important too, is that element of hope, which is that Anne truly believes that these things that you let go, they come back. And that's the evidences with Marcy and Sasha who show up at the aquarium to be with her again. So it's, it's funny because like, I think the ending is very sweet. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I'm yeah, very, like, yeah, yeah, like I was like, no, this is the happy ending, you guys. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, they, yeah. they hold each <laughs> other so closely in their hearts and that they're going to live their lives always having that. How could that ever be sad? You know what I mean? From, from my point of view. Um, but, you know, it, it also is just I've always wanted to be, you know, bold with this show and really say what was important to me. And my experience with my friend group was that you know, as, as tight as we were and as, as many adventures as we had and as, as, as much as we loved each other, we did ultimately drift apart. And like, you know, I'm not saying that is a guarantee. I'm saying that if it happens, it's okay. So, you know, to answer your question, like, how could I? <laughs> uh, my answer is because I, I felt compelled to, that I, I felt like it was important to this piece and it was the last missing element of this story about change, I guess. But like, you know, I, I really do want to empower people to, in their own way, like their own headcanons or their own imaginations that like, there's any number of ways these characters could reunite. And also, also, the girls are 23. Like, they're so young. There's like so much life ahead of them. Like, I, I saw like a comment that was like, you know, how could you tear them apart? Like, you know, like this is, this show should be about change, not about like the ending of a relationship. And I was like, they have so much time in their lives to kind of like, especially with uh, Marcy and Sasha, to get to know each other again. Like there's, you know, while you still have breath, it's not like, 
you know what I mean? You're, it's not like their lives are over. They're very young. And it's funny because like, I'm, I'm 30, 33. And when I think of 23, I'm like, Oh my God, I was so young. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know how old you guys are, <laughs> but like, <laughs> yeah, how are you? I'm, 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 oh, yeah. Nice. Oh, I'm 20. I'm 20. Nice. Yeah, I'm 20. You have so, there's so much more, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> how could your story ever be over? <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I guess, you know, again, everyone's entitled to their opinion and, I fully respect, you know, uh, but just know that like what I was after was very specific and very important to me that like it was this, this is the story, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and if you, if you rewatch the show, understanding that this is a story about these three girls independent from each other for the first time in probably a long time are finding their best selves and how like sometimes in life you need to spend some time apart, grow as a person, come back together again, and you'll find that you have a much stronger bond because of it. So it's it's really this like, you know, it's a very adult message though for a, for a kid's show. I, I'll 100% admit, admit that. I think that is that is super fair. And like also like, you know, there are those summers that felt like the best summers ever or those experiences that we had and like we cannot return to them. You know what I mean? So like it, it just felt like, an ending where they can all like hang out felt just very disingenuous to me. But again, that's me. That's my creative sensibility. Do with that what you will. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I, honestly, I, I do think it was the right move because when you just think about, it, I mean, everyone, the, the entire yeah. cast themselves, they had to accept some form, yeah, some element of that theme themselves, right? Like, so to have Anne sort of get off scot free, like she just yeah, like, exactly. Like, like it, it just wouldn't be fair. I mean, Sasha Marsh, they went through like three seasons of hell because they just wouldn't accept that their friendship won't always be the same, right? I mean, you can't just have Anne like it. It just wouldn't. I mean, it's what I mean, no. Plus, we have Sprig. I mean, you guys did like. I mean, you guys were next to Sprig. Like, you killed Anne, right? Like, you had to, to accept Anne dying. Well, and then the ending, so I've never seen her again. And like, yeah, I yeah, think... Spring got to learn that lesson twice. So it's like, you, you got to let Anne, like, you have to let Anne learn the same thing. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that, you know, it's, you, you put it well when you say that, like, you know, for her to just kind of, like, miraculously get this nice thing, which is just to see them whenever she wants, it does feel like it, it flies in the face of the kind of, the message of the piece you know what i mean where it's just kind yeah. of like you know um and life is is not about just getting the things you want like i feel like there's there's so much of this that's like you know you will you will face um irreversible change and i think because of the experience experiences that the characters had throughout this entire show they're able to kind of face that with courage so that's sort of like you know what i mean like i don't know it's it's uh, it's something that like everyone experiences, whether they want to or not. And it may be friendship. It may be someone you love. You know what I mean? Like it's there's there's any number of permutations on this, but like I do think it's an important thing to hear that it's gonna be it's gonna be okay. Like I think a lot about when I when I made the show, I think about the end of Gravity Falls a lot. Do you guys you you guys seen Gravity Falls? Have you seen it all? The oh years? yeah, no, 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 we we both yeah, yeah. Gravity Falls. Like we we like, yeah, yeah. So the end of Gravity Falls is sort of you know, because we're together, it's going to be okay. It's sort of the takeaway where they, the brother and sister go into the unknown together, but because they have each other, it's going to be okay. I sort of wanted to deliver uh, a companion message. Not, it's, it doesn't refute anything. These, these messages go hand in hand. And that's the thing about life is that, you know, but like our message is sometimes you won't be together and that's okay. So it's kind of like the yin and the yang for those two shows because I, I came off of Gravity Falls being like, I love that message. I love it. And so I wanted to share something from my life, too. You know what I mean? That was completely different. Yeah. Like, yeah. Thank you, man. Yeah. I think that's a, yeah. it's probably a good time yeah. to like wrap up. And <laughs> yeah. That, that concludes like this week's recording. Like Whoever's listening, like whoever has, is, or plans on watching, listening to this podcast, like thank you so much. Um, especially to our past like contributors on the show. Uh, special thanks to Gratifying for making the thumbnail you'll see. And thanks, Nick, for co-hosting alongside with me. And thank you, Matt, for coming on tonight. And just Yeah, my, my, my pleasure. I, I sort of want to add just like a little like caveat or just food for thought, which is that like, 
you know, art, art and media is, is to be discussed and to be like interpreted. And like, that's, that's a strong opinion of mine is that like, you cannot be wrong. You know what I mean? Like in whatever you think about the show or whatever you perceive or interpret from its ending, you, like it's your opinion. That will always just be your opinion. And I think what I would love to add is just to like <laughs> respect like the opinion of others, respect that like, you know, if you don't like something, it doesn't mean everyone has to dislike it. You know what I mean? These are all like kind of thoughts I've had about like, you know, you make something, you put it out there. And like, I think, you know, like we talked about earlier, the idea that I would receive messages like, like hate messages because of like something I said on a podcast once that were just like really ungenerous. I would just say, wait a beat before you like at me with something like where you're like, how could you, you monster or something like that. Just like, I know, just give it a moment, give it a thought. And then, hey, have at it. All right. Thank you, Matt. So uh, thanks for listening to this week's recording or watching this video. We'll be back in, we're, we're going to take a few months off just to kind of like figure out what to do next, but we'll, we'll be back eventually. Thanks for listening again. Um, say goodbye to everyone. Cool. Thanks for having me, you guys. It was a pleasure. Say goodbye, Nick. See you guys.